I am here with Backyard Expeditions, and we are working together to discuss and describe and appreciate every single bird group in the entire world. And we are on our final four bird groups. So I hope you're ready to learn some interesting things about these final four bird groups. Are you ready to go, uh, John? I'm ready. This is a very interesting little lineup of birds. Excellent. Well, let's get right into our first one, the Trogoniformes. 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 Thanks, Mary Rose. Trogoniformes. These are the trogons and the quetzals. There are 43 species. The famous members, I would say the resplendent quetzal as pictured, uh, and not the other ones. Trogons are birds that don't fly much. They are sedentary, meaning they don't migrate, and they are also not very active in hunting prey. They generally sit still, scanning for food, then swoop down and grab an insect flying past, then sit some more. The resplendent quetzal is important to the mythology of Central America. Trogons have unique feet among birds, with the first two toes backwards instead of the first and fourth, like in every other two toes backward. Bird. Are these birds diverse? So how many species did we... 43, and there's two types. So not really a diverse group of birds. No, sorry. Uh, they don't get the diversity star, but are these birds famous? The resplendent quetzal is probably one of the most famous birds for birders, mm-hmm. particularly. Mm-hmm. That's like goal of... I would think a lot of birders is you got to get to these Mesoamerican cloud forests to see Quetzals, Mm -hmm. which is what this image is from when, when I was there. So you Um, got yours. You you saw your resplendent Quetzal. Yeah. With the, with the tail feathers and everything, they lose them, which is an interesting fact about the resplendent Quetzal (laughs) is that, well, they're not tail feathers one. And then they're from the, they're the very end of the back feathers. I don't know exactly what to call them. A lot of birds are like that, like birds of paradise and peacocks. The, what you think is the tail isn't the tail. It's it's feathers off the off the kind of the rump. Oh, interesting. So they're like extended contour feathers and not caudal yeah, like feathers. Really extended. Yeah, they're not the the uh, the retresses. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they and because and the resplendent quetzals do lose them after kind of the breeding cycle. So I was able to get get to see a male with long tail feathers before they all lost them. I should mention here that on Backyard Expeditions channel, he does all of his own photography and videography right now. So um, y- you can see some very beautiful images and know the person who is uh, talking took them. While that one bird is famous and probably regionally is very famous... It is important to the mythology of, of, of Central America. Right. Yeah. So does that make it famous? I don't know. The thing is, is I don't think if you if you aren't a birder, they're very beautiful, but I don't know how famous they are. Like maybe if they're your national bird. I mean, anywhere in Mesoamerica, they're very famous. Uh, the, that's resplendent Quetzal is very famous. I mean, I think the money in Guatemala is called a Quetzal. Like, <laughs> like the actual bills are called Quetzals. And they're the, and I know the Cuban trogon is the national bird of Cuba or Cuba. I, mm-hmm. I get that confused too. The regionally they're famous, and if you're a birder, especially in the Western Hemisphere, you're gonna want to see them. They also do exist pantropically. If you're a giant bird nerd or an ornithologist, you have to study them because their feet are different than the other yeah. birds. So it's like it's kind of a weird bird. I would say. They're famous among a select group of people, but if you randomly pick someone in Europe or North America, they're not going to probably wouldn't. The qualification statement is would most people remember it exists on a list of birds? We can make an argument that that the resplendent cuts all deserves it, but I don't know the group as the rest of the group. Yeah. All right. That's fine. They don't. They don't have to get the fame star. Though we we I think we acknowledge that regionally it's going to be very different. Um, are these birds amazing? They're pretty cool. Um, there are a few species that nest in wasps' nests as kind of a defense. <laughs> That's a good defense if you can pull it off. I guess. Like, who's going to invade? Yeah, That's very interesting that they are able to pull that off. That's amazing. So their babies grow up in this completely inhospitable environment that no other animal could apparently survive in. And they're just like, yeah, this is, this is where I live. <laughs> it's, yeah, it makes me really curious. And it, it gets into the intriguing. Like, yeah, I'm just curious how, like, 
the process like is it this like awful thing where they're like dig where this like there's this trogon just like digging into this <laughs> nest and it's like fl- or is it like this like slow like slowly removing hmm. pieces and it just it's like it's like wasp jenga or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely a game that you don't want to lose. <laughs> okay, so we can safely give them the amazing star because they live inside amazing places, or some of them do. And intriguing, can we give them two stars for the same thing? They've got to have something else intriguing about them, right? I'm always intrigued by how just hard they are to see. This has like been my experience with Trogons, is they're very sedentary. They don't move a lot. They're exceptionally quiet most of the time. It's just this bird that just, and that's part of it is you, they don't move much. They kind of just sit in a tree and then they have a very, very specific way of how they just sort of tilt their head around. And, and yeah, it is sort of scanning for food. But it is like weird. It's like, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a trogon. It sits there for a little bit and moves on. They're so brightly colored. It's very interesting that somehow camouflage wise, it seems to work. They have more behavioral camouflage that by staying very, very still, they appear more invisible than they would otherwise. I'm thinking that's, that's, that's my guess of why they're really good at hiding, because they are really good at hiding. Do you know any more about this scanning behavior? I'm trying to think. I've watched it on multiple species, and they all do it. And I'm assuming it's just they're looking, and they're, like, searching for a food item. I mean, it's almost, like, robotic in a way. It's like they're scanning. It's it's like... it's like. Would you say that you are intrigued to learn more? I would, I would be interested to know, because it, it, it is different than hawking in, say, uh, kingbirds. It's very weird. I would like to learn. <laughs> yeah, but I'd like to know more about. Okay. So you give them amazing. We give them intriguing because of their very robotic behavior. Are these birds beautiful? They are. Um, yeah, they are some of the most beautiful birds in the world. Yeah. Actually, that's another interesting question is in the old world, there are so many different variations of color where in the new world, they're basically all green with red breasts or some derivative of that. There's a couple that change it up where it's more orange. Mm -hmm. or yellow Hmm. and then they're more blue but in the old world you have ones that are entirely red wow okay i'd I'd give them the intriguing star again for that one (laughs) but it sounds like a very beautiful species a beautiful group of birds yeah it's a very beautiful birds trogons are all very beautiful birds okay let's give them a beautiful star with a put like a plus on the intriguing star (laughs) we can't do that because then we'd have to go back and start sorting on oh no like no so they got three out of five stars which is respectable and we're going to move on to the next group of birds and see how they do which are the pteroclyformes the sand grouse Mm, it's a bird group there's 16 yeah. species and which is surprising 16 that yeah. is surprising that there are that many sand grouse and all of the members of this group are sand grouse they're nothing else sand grouse live in big treeless areas like plains and savannas where they eat whatever seeds they can find they are ground dwelling birds by necessity with no trees around but they are also strong flyers They must fly to a watering hole at least once a day. The adults will drink as fast as they can, but they also have unique belly feathers which unfurl when wet to soak up extra water. This water is probably for their chicks, but I couldn't find what they do with the extra water the rest of the year, so maybe they drink their own belly feather water. So they (laughs) got like a canteen belly. Are these birds diverse? I mean, they're surprisingly diverse for just being one tiny group of birds, but no. No. <laughs> yeah. That was easy. Are these birds famous? Probably also an easy one. Probably not. Yeah. I, certain people, they're physiologically interesting, but that's not going to make them famous to most people. Yeah. Sorry. But they should be. They should be famous. <laughs> I could just have like a, a little clip of you saying they should be and just put it after every uh, star that isn't <laughs> awarded. But they should be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are these birds amazing? 
I think they're very amazing at surviving in these like incredibly harsh conditions. And then this whole idea is like, oh, they'll just port the water. That's how they get around the whole idea of a oh, waterfall. Water holes are very, very dangerous places to have little babies. Mm-hmm. Just bring them the water from somewhere else. Yeah, don't don't bring the babies to the water. Bring the water to the babies. So they developed a uh, canteen belly so that they can bring water to their babies we should we you need to start an outdoor exploration company and like you know the camel back yeah we got the sand sand grouse and you got like- <laughs> sand grouse belly <laughs> okay so you have a pouch and you have your bottles in it and it's called the sand grouse belly or just the sand grouse okay because <laughs> sand grouse belly sounds gross um, <laughs> so these birds are amazing for two reasons one of which is that they can survive in extremely dry and arid places and still manage to find enough seeds and stuff to live uh, in places that other animals can't, and then they also have their they're constantly sand grousing. Mm-hmm. Are these birds intriguing? I would love to know the evolutionary steps of the feathers between mm-hmm. regular bird feathers and these weird special wet absorbing feathers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point because uh, normal feathers you they dry out before they got back to the babies, so they have no use that way yeah i mean i could see maybe a little bit of moisture maybe Mm -hmm. getting there but it's like Mm -hmm. yeah what are the steps to get to that highly derived yeah i can think of it being like the babies have to be pretty close to the water and the parents just kind of run back and forth between the water and the babies and then you know the babies get eaten by predators if you're too close so the ones that could go further were able to (laughs) to have more babies and slowly they could you know they're miles away out in the middle of nowhere this is just one possibility and it would be interesting to study more with like somebody that actually knew what they were talking about with sand unfortunately i don't think i don't know if i don't know if all sand grass have this derived feature that'd be an interesting evolutionary question to ask yeah i agree Okay, so there's potentially something to learn from them. Are these birds beautiful? I think they look pretty nice. I've always (laughs) kind of, I've always kind of liked sand grouse. Okay, they definitely go a lot with the brown on brown on brown color scheme. They do, they do a lot with the brown on brown. (laughs) Yeah, just little accents here and there. Okay, it's a nice looking bird. It's a little partridge looking thing. It it looks good. (laughs) And they can get the beautiful star, which uh, is very difficult for a brown on brown on brown species. So, Mm. so they got three out of five stars. And it's the same three out of five stars. We may have a different pattern going on this time. Let's see if that continues in our next bird group, which are the, oh boy, Cariamiformes. Yeah, since I'm thinking it's a, it's somehow like a Latinized version of Cariamiformes. So these are the Cariamas. There are two species. That's it. They're both Cariamas. Seriemas are small South American birds with long legs. They are probably the last surviving descendants of the enormous carnivorous terror birds, but there is some controversy about this. They are mostly carnivorous, but they terrorize lizards and frogs. They also eat plant material if there are no animals to eat. They're a much less terrifying version of the terror bird. Are these birds diverse? No. No. The red leg Suriyama is found all over South America. Hmm. And then the other one is like really, really geographically restricted. Interesting. Okay. Uh, okay, so they're not diverse. Uh, are these birds famous? Uh, they're at least sister to terror birds, which makes them mildly in- kind of famous. They should be famous. <laughs> Just... be my meme from this episode. <laughs> they should be they famous. They should be famous. Okay, but they are not, unfortunately. Are these birds amazing? They're kind of they're, they're kind of like uh, convergent with like a secretary bird, mm-hmm. a little smaller than a secretary bird, but kind of that crazy kicking bird. They're also a little aggressive. Apparently, uh, they'll take on people. Oh wow! Yeah, I think they're kind of they kind of kick their prey. Ooh, that's cool. Okay, that's amazing. Are these birds intriguing? Uh, the only thing that is really interesting, and this is just a fact of, of you know, watching Siriamas sort of do their thing, uh, they sunbathe on their backs. <laughs> With their legs up in the air? Kind of, yeah, they do that sometimes. 
so they know how to relax. Uh, that is definitely unusual among birds, because that mm-hmm. kind of reduces their ability to run away. What's the point of being able to fly if you are then laying on your back? Yeah, I'm chilling. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. There's some questions to answer there. Maybe that's left over from when they were terror birds, so that they were yeah, like... Maybe terror birds just laid around on their backs. That'd be awesome. Because they were so um, big and terrifying that, like, ah, oh, nobody's going to mess with me. So, Sari Emma's have that, too. I want to see some, like, cute paleo art of, like, you know, Kalekans lying on their back, taking cues from the Sariyama behavior to be like, oh, maybe terror birds, when they fell asleep, they were, they lay on their backs. <laughs> okay. I am interested phylogenetically where they fall because they're at least i think they've they've always come out sister to terror birds Mm -hmm. but i don't know if terror birds are within their group so there's definitely more to learn about them are these birds beautiful i think they are but yeah they're not they i mean they've got like the nice the red bill and like the blue eye ring and they got like those funky feathers that make them look kind of fancy but yeah then they're just sort of brown are they beautiful like, the problem is, is, like, compared to most birds, no. They look like a really fancy chicken with a yeah. face thing. The well, face thing is nice. We probably should err on the side of caution. <laughs> I think they're nice, but not beautiful. Sorry, Sari Emma's. You got two stars out of five. See if our final group can turn things around. That is the Kukuli Formies. Is it really just, like, cuckoo? Okay, so cuckooly formies, the cuckoos. Yeah. There are 149 species, and the famous members are cuckoos, of which this is one, and surprisingly, the roadrunners are also in this group. This bird Very weird. and yeah. a roadrunner. Cuckoos are broadly distributed around the world. Some are sedentary, but others have incredibly long migrations. Cuckoos are the most newsworthy of birds, as we learned in a previous video. Some cuckoos build their own nests and lay eggs there. A few species have communal nests, where a group builds a nest together and lays all their eggs into it, then share the responsibility of chick rearing. But the most famous nesting behavior of cuckoos is from the 60 species that are brood parasites. They lay their eggs in nests maintained by other species. The young cuckoo hatches quickly and either kills or outcompetes its adopted siblings. Cuckoos and many other species are in an evolutionary arms race to succeed or thwart brood parasitic behavior. Are these birds diverse? There's 149 species. That's enough. And then that's over 100. And then you've got you got cuckoos. You got kuas, which which should be famous. But, okay. but nobody knows what a kua is. They're I, I don't know. species. <laughs> okay. Uh, another then there's malacolas, which are really pretty birds. You got annies, the two species of roadrunner. You got quite a few cuckoo like birds. I've heard of roadrunners, uh, but the other ones no. Anyway, they, they're diverse. There's somebody out there who knows what those words are, and that is great. Are these birds famous? Well, we got two animated characters. We got the Roadrunner from, from Looney right, Tunes. Right, And the Cuckoo Cocoa Puffs bird, which doesn't look anything like a cuckoo. <laughs> Maybe a little bit like a Roadrunner. It, it's probably a cuckoo. And then, not to mention, there's basically an entire art form dedicated to these birds in Cuckoo Clocks. Oh, Yeah! That's true. There are people who build mechanical versions of these. And it's like a thing. So theoretically, somebody could make a cuckoo roadrunner clock. I'm sure that exists. (laughs) So it's a roadrunner like running around. Every time it goes around, it whistles a little bit or something. Okay, so yes, by the cartoon character test, these birds are famous, like doubly famous. Are there cartoon Annie's or the other ones that you listed? <laughs> okay. That's there right. Should be. There should there be. Should. Are these birds amazing? So, as you said, long distance migrations. The Pacific long tailed cuckoo breeds in New Zealand, but then it flies to little tiny Pacific islands out thousands of miles away, which is truly remarkable for mm. a forest bird. Like, it's one thing, mm. okay. Shorebirds, you know, they can just sit down on a beach somewhere, like, mm-hmm. or a seabird can rest on the ocean. Like, these mm-hmm. are forest birds. Mm-hmm. They can't stop. 
And then the fact that they can navigate from one place to another reliably yeah. when there's no visible landmarks, like that's, that's amazing. And then there's the cuckoos, which in my videos called Birds in the News, there are two different cuckoos that had made these epic migrations, one flying from Mongolia to South Africa and back, and then one flying from Africa to um, the UK in just like a few days. And those are common cuckoos. And uh, yeah, cuckoos and, are pretty amazing birds. Mm -hmm, for sure. So let's give them the amazing star. Are these birds intriguing in some way? So the arms race between the parasites and hosts is just a really interesting active field of research currently mm -hmm. sort of understanding the dynamics between yeah. these different birds yeah there there are different brood uh parasite defense strategies one is if they detect an egg in the nest they can just kick all the eggs out of the nest and uh, start over with new eggs they can if they're lucky enough, they can identify the one brood parasite egg and kick that out. But there's some like patterning strategies where the cuckoos are like laying eggs that have the same speckle patterns as the eggs that are already in the nest. So all the weavers have different patterns of eggs. So like they can tell <laughs> if the, those are like the advanced ones, like it's, oh, the cuckoo doesn't quite have the right speckling. And the only reason that they have those speckle patterns is like an anti-counterfeiting strategy to help keep cuckoos <laughs> from laying eggs in their nest. Um, and then what else? You can, uh, some birds just build an entire second nest on top of their original nest. I, I know uh, yellow warblers do that with cowbird eggs and not cuckoos, but okay. it's sort of, I'm sure other birds have develop that same strategy but that is a cool strategy they just <laughs> pile nests on top of oh and then weavers like have enclosed spherical yeah. nests so that other animals can't come in and lay eggs and they have like extremely long sort of entrance tunnels that you know to defend against cuckoos you make that like you know two or three feet long mm -hmm. it's very difficult and, to and climb it, up and it's a really not... tight climb like it's the same size as the bird that's going inside yeah so if you're not a weaver it's very difficult to get in yeah so while all of this defense is going on the cuckoos on the other hand are also adapting one after the other these different species are coming up with like strategy and counter strategy for these 60 species of cuckoo they have to find a way to succeed at this or they like that's it the generation doesn't continue so anyway my point is out of all of this is that this is a rich vein of biology if you want to know more about the way that things um interact with selective pressures this is a source where you can see it in real time oh, yeah. year after year like <laughs> one species and if, you're, and if you're interested in ornithology this is a very active area of research that many labs are working at uh, so it's really likely that we're going to discover more interesting things in the coming coming years i think we can very safely just for the that one thing but um for brood parasitic behavior and the interesting things we can learn about that we can give them the intriguing star very safely finally are these birds beautiful there are so many spectacular species. I mean, this is a gorgeous cuckoo. Roadrunners look really nice with the brown on brown. Yeah. Uh, they have that cool crest. Um, and then there, even the common cuckoo is like pretty nice. So, yeah. uh, there's a couple like in Madagascar. The kuas are really pretty, and uh, malacolas are a very beautiful group of birds. So yeah, they're very pretty. Awesome. Uh, okay. Uh, we, I think we can give them the uh, beautiful star, which makes them not only the final bird group out of all the bird groups that we're going to talk about, all the living bird groups in the entire world, but it is the final five star bird group out of that entire. Yay! <laughs> it's us from the future. So, funny story. There is a whole nother bird group. It's called Cathartiformes, and we're going to rank them also. So the way that this bird group got dropped was that some bird organizations do not count this as a group. They've merged it with Exhibitriformes, and some bird experts still count it as its own bird group. The whole thing was we went with uh, Cornell. If they say it, it's probably yeah. correct. And then for me, it was because Vernon said that it existed. So I was like, yeah, he's probably right. He knows what he's talking about. So thanks, Vernon. Yeah, the uh, thanks a lot for yeah picking that up. Because it's like I've seen them as part of it as, as citrus reformies. And they're just sister to it. So it's like two kind of raptorial birds that have some similarities. But they're quite um, evolutionarily distinct. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, cool. 
Okay, so Cathartiformes, there are seven species. These are the New World Vultures. The famous members are vultures and condors. These birds smell great. That is, they probably smell terrible, but they have an amazing sense of smell that lets them detect dead animals from way up in the air. They clean up the environment by eating rotting meat and removing it before it spreads disease and feeds pests like flies. The condors are enormous, the largest flying land birds in the Americas. They may have grown to such enormous sizes on the carcasses of Ice Age animals. With the disappearance of the mastodons, California condors are on the brink of extinction. Every other member of the group is doing much better. Are these birds diverse? No, we only have a mere seven individuals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're not, not diverse. Are these birds famous? This one is interesting, I think, because... They're completely centralized on two continents. So on only, you know, one part of the globe. If you ask anybody in the Americas, they probably have mm -hmm. either heard of them or seen one. And I mean the turkey vulture is basically ubiquitous in North and North America. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna say probably, and then on top of that, the Andean condor is actually tied with the golden eagle as oh. being the national symbol of five countries. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so um, it's a symbol in multiple countries. What about just the popularity of the term vulture? Like there's vulture capitalists and things like that, but there's two <laughs> different groups of birds that are called vultures. I think I'm, I'm trying to think whether the griffin vulture or the turkey vulture is the most... Because the problem is, is most vulture depictions are somewhat based on a griffin vulture mm -hmm. with kind of that longer neck versus that, mm -hmm. you know, that weird little tiny pink head. Yeah. But you do see turkey vulture depictions quite often, so it's kind of one of those things where it's like, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so we can't use that as a, because that might refer to old world vultures. By the way, these are two completely separate groups that share the same name. They're well, they're related, but oh. distantly. They're two sister orders. Okay. They both converged on this whole obligate scavenger thing separately. Mm. So we have turkey vultures are definitely famous in the Americas because they're in North and South America. The word vulture is famous. Condor's reasonably famous, like just condor. I think people know what a condor is. I mm -hmm. would feel like outside of them being the national symbol, uh, Andean condors being national symbols, I think like condors are reasonably well known. Like that, that word, and it is unique to them. Okay. It's probably famous enough. I feel like they're famous. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> this one is one of the most borderline cases that we've ever had, but I feel like these are famous. The national bird thing, definitely, like, it's five whole countries. Tied, yeah, <laughs> tied with the golden eagle. Okay, we'll call them famous. We'll give them the fame star. Are these birds amazing? Do they have some impressive trait? These are like some of the largest flying birds. In fact, the largest flying bird ever was a member of this order, uh, Argentavis, that lived a couple million years ago hmm. and had like, you know, wingspans in like the 23 foot range. <laughs> Which is like twice as big as the current largest bird. Yeah, it's just this huge bird. It's all basically restricted to the New World vultures now, but there used to be this whole diversity of Cathartiformes. And I think with the Teratons being the uh, kind of the most famous of the large extinct species group. They are apparently, from what I was reading, they're less, they were actually less of obligate scavengers and more predatory. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, but yeah, the, and turkey vultures are famous for that sense of smell. I, I think we may have mentioned this in the Accipitriformes video, but that sense of smell is really impressive. It is, yeah. Being able to smell anything from a hundred or a thousand feet in the air, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay, so let's give him the amazing star. Are these birds intriguing? Do you want to know more? I'm kind of, one of the things when, when we're talking about the old world vultures is that really cool kind of thing where you have different vultures that all kind of feed on a different part of an animal mm -hmm. and sort of reduce the carcass into nothing over the course of a couple hours and i'm really interested if that similar sort of behavior exists in the americas with our hmm. vultures another totally weird intriguing fact that i just happened upon in out of observation 
mm-hmm. uh, that I actually got footage of was black vultures will aloe preen um, a crest, crested caracaras. Huh. Caracaras are like ground dwelling car- pre- predators, and they like. Yeah. I mean, they perch up in trees, but they're kind of these generally ground, low, branch hanging falcon relatives. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, black vultures from and this is these are observations ranging from Texas. I saw it in Costa Rica, and da- and then I've seen other observation stuff down in like uh, Brazil. So it's this widespread phenomena where these two species overlap, and the Black vultures will allocreen the heads of these these crested caracaras. Car- 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 <laughs> That's super weird. That's very intriguing because, okay, so let's say an, a vulture comes up to you and it's got whatever its last meal was is on its head. And it's like, hey, I want to fix your hair. Like, can I put my beak in your hair? I at least would say, no, thank you. Like, I don't need any product in my hair. Just leave it as it is. But the Karakara is apparently like, yes, please, please just put your beak in my hair, in my feathers. And like, it's very understudied topic. It's definitely something that really could use like somebody who (laughs) wants to actually study what's happening. Because the problem is, is, like, alloprening presumably has some like parasite control Mm -hmm. function. It's also a heavily, it's heavily social, like it's a pair bonding thing, too. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I don't know, right, it's these two completely different species that don't seem to really hang out all that much together, mm-hmm. but for whatever reason, they sometimes, the one species to alloprene the other. All right, well, we don't have to know the answers, we just have to have a question to give the intriguing star, and I think we've got a great question, which is, what's up with that? Are these birds beautiful? I have prepared a selection of vultures, if you would like to look at them. This This is a whole borderline order, because it's like, condors are like some of the most majestic birds on the planet. Yes, agreed. Like When you see them up in the sky... I think I they're not I think that it's hard to call them I think they look learned they're not like the marabou stork where there's just like frizzy hair everywhere mm-hmm. it's frizzy feathers it's okay. like they've lost all the feathers so they have like this grandfatherly sort of like okay. wise appearance of them close up i get what you're saying they don't look decrepit they look wrinkled and what wizened here's an andean condor you're correct, it is featherless, but it is also, like, well-groomed. Then there's the California condor. I, I think they look better than that in real life. Um, and then the one member of this group that I agree is beautiful, the king vulture. King vulture, I mean, they look like a Mayan art come to life or something. Like They're, they're bright, they're colorful, mm-hmm. they're white. I mean, mm-hmm. they're just these, these truly gorgeous birds. Probably one of the prettiest birds of gray type bird but yeah it's like one of those things they pretty much all look good in the air mm-hmm. and then it's like this whole varying thing of what does the head look like i mean <laughs> turkey vultures are not the most pretty but they're weird and then they have like the hole in the middle of their nose they're like because they have the canaries uh meat in the middle this i think is the borderline this is a really hard one i think there's seven species and king yeah, vultures I, I, are one seventh of this group like, it's a whole seven are gorgeous. <laughs> and, and the condors are both really majestic. Mm-hmm. Controversial opinion. Let's give them the beautiful star. Vultures deserve the beautiful star. <laughs> they got four out of five stars. For a bird that almost got skipped entirely, <laughs> that is a good save. <laughs> I got their save. Okay, back to your previously scheduled conclusion. <laughs> Well, it's good to end on a high note. We uh, talked about some pretty amazing birds this time. We're going to have one more episode where we wrap up and talk about uh, the final rankings from bottom to top, uh, from zero stars to five stars. Which bird group is the most amazing in the entire world? So I hope if uh, you're excited that you'll be subscribing and checking back in a couple weeks for that episode to come out. Um, You can also go over to Backyard Expedition's channel in the meantime and learn about some amazing bird facts. He's making some interesting bird videos right now, and I'm learning some interesting things over there. So um, subscribe here, subscribe there, and we'll see you in a couple weeks for the final episode of Every Bird Group Ranked. Very exciting. (laughs) Thanks for stopping by this week to learn what makes life awesome.
with the first two toes backwards instead of the first and fourth, like in every other two toes backward bird. Wow. Me in the past kind of like thought that was a good concluding sentence. Okay.